Good morning. What a wonderful day to be here. Uh, what wonderful weather. If you like the shade, there's still a few shade spots. If you like the sun, I think it's going to be here today. I see some people kind of enjoying the sun a little bit. <laughs> That's good. It's wonderful. And welcome to all you folks that are joining us virtually. We're doing the project for Take the Next Step. Uh, that is a, uh, a we, we've got some money in our budget that we've got that is this fiscal year that's going to end at the end of the month. So we're offering a matching grant type of thing. So as we're trying to raise $1,000 for Take the Next Step. If you don't know what Take the Next Step is, it's a wonderful organization that helps people that are in, in need in our, in our community. Uh, if you have more questions about it, we'll be doing that this week and next week. And then I think the 28th will be the end of it and we'll go on from there. It's been such a blessing. You know, we've done projects recently, and to see folks just come together to be able to support people in our community, uh, to be able to support the work over at Brookdale, uh, to do things like we did for Africa with, uh, with the mosquito nets. It's just such a good thing to see God's people coming together to share our resources to be able to help those in need. And I want to encourage us to continue to do that. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give ear, O Lord, to the prayers of your people, and listen to their cry for mercy. You, O Lord, are merciful and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Lord of mercy, we confess that we are full of sin, but in you there is an abundance of righteousness and a wealth of mercy. We are poor sinners whose thoughts, words, and deeds show our weakness. You, Lord, are gracious and merciful through Jesus Christ our Lord. You have saved us by his blood. Give us true repentance that we know your forgiveness and the comfort of a clear conscience. Give us also hearts made new by your grace that we love you above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. By your Holy Spirit, we do what is pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This is always one of my favorite times in the service. It's a time that I get to look at you and tell you the good news that you're forgiven. No matter what's happened in the last week, whether it be your personal sins, whether it be for those sins that we're a, a part of because we live in a society that's bigger than us and we've somehow been a part of that, no matter what those sins are, Jesus died for them. And because of that, you're forgiven. You're forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So you can't get together and hug each other yet. We're working on that. Someday that's going to come. But from your distant spots there, see if you can catch somebody's eye, greet them, let them know of the love of the Lord with them. If you're online, send a message to somebody. And this greeting of the peace is not just during church. It's something that we're going to do through the week as we try to reach out to each other and encourage each other. So if we have some kids that are here that want to come up, we've got a stick. Okay, I Pray with me. Dear God, Help us to learn about you and about your love. Amen. Okay, got to go back over there. That's so hard. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Doesn't make. I got a couple things. One, do you guys know what weeds are? You know what a weed is? Yeah, and but sometimes they're hard to tell which one's a good plant or which one's a bad plant. Like this, is this a weed or is that a flower? Well, it's got flowers on it, but you know what? I pulled it out of my garden, and I think it's a weed. It's kind of, it, it would, but what it does is it just takes the food of the, of the good plants. Now, this one, is that a weed or a flower? That one's a flower. Yeah, because my, my, my wife likes these, and she saves them. So that makes it a flower because she likes it, right? So anyway, I got another. I got a picture of one. How about these? One of these is a weed, and one is a flower. And I'm going to tell you, one of them, if you touch it, it will make you all itchy. And if you eat it, it would make you really sick. And one of them, if you eat it, it'll taste good, and it would be, well, not real good, but it tastes pretty good. <laughs> anyway, so which one do you think it is? Is this one the weed or the flower? What do you think? Weed or flower? 
What do you think? Weed or flour? Yeah, okay. Well, we're going to say, you guys are right. That one is poison ivy. Yuck, right? And that one is called elderberry. So you can, you can make juice out of it and, and other stuff. Sometimes it's hard to tell what's a weed and a flower, right? Sometimes it's hard to tell which one's good and which one's bad. Well, Jesus told a story, and he said he was just going to leave the weeds in the garden. And he said, it's not our job to figure out what's a good weed and what's a bad weed. You know whose job it is? God's job. So when we see people, sometimes we see people, and you see a person, and they look scary. Oh, I have my face on. They look scary. You ever see a scary-looking person? No? Well, that's good. But sometimes that person in their heart is not a bad person at all, right? And it's not our job to figure that out. That's God's job, and that's what this story is about, okay? So if you find a weed, what do you do with it? In the garden. You pick it out and throw it out. But in the world, if you, find a, if you see another person, you just love them like Jesus loves them. And Jesus loves who? You, and you, and you, and you. Okay. Let's pray again. Dear God, thank you that you love every person no matter how they look. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless. You guys can go back. Testament lesson is from Isaiah chapter 54, verses 6 through 8. In this reading, God proclaims that he is the only God. He is the only one who can save. This is what the Lord, the King of Israel, and its Redeemer, the Lord of Armies, says. I am the first and I am the last. There is no God but me. Who, like me, can announce the future? Let him say so and make a case before me, since I have established an ancient people. Let these gods declare the coming things and what will take place. Do not be startled or afraid. Have I not told you and declared it long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any God but me? There is no other rock. I do not know any. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle is from... Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 27. In this section of Romans, Paul tells us that we struggle with all creation as we wait for God to reveal his kingdom. As we longingly wait, the Spirit intercedes for us. 
For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself will be will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Not only that, but we ourselves who have the spirit in the first fruits are also grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with inexpressible groanings, and he who searches out our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel, Matthew 13, 24 through 30, and 36 through 43. Jesus tells a story about evil in the world. Evil is not from God, but God lets it be for now. Ultimately, he will deal with evil, and we will be with him forever. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat and left. When the plants sprouted and produced grain, the weeds also appeared. The landowner's servants came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and pull them up? The servants asked him. No, he said. When you pull up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them, but collect the wheat in my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. His disciples approached him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He replied, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. And the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears listen. This is the special good news of the Lord.
Let's uh, start out by praying together. Father, as we come to you today, uh, we look at a world that uh, sometimes is broken, and it's hard for us to understand why you don't just jump in and fix things in our world. And so today, as we look at your word, we pray that you'll give us insight. But more than that, that your Holy Spirit will create faith in our hearts, that we trust in you, and that you are the one who ultimately overcomes all evil, whether it be in our world or in us. Thank you for your love. Help us to hear you clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. But six million Jewish people were herded like cattle in the concentration camps and executed. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. But millions of Africans were stolen from their homeland, shipped into a life of slavery, half died in the passage. Generations of the survivors' descendants were treated like draft animals to be bought and sold. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Yet within 25 years, starting in 1846, 80% of all Native Americans living in California were killed. A concentrated effort was made either to kill Native Americans or destroy their culture. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And yet we could talk about Rwanda, Cambodia, Bosnia, ancient China, many, many other ancient countries. See, a lot of really bad stuff has happened. And so our question is, how did this very good world get to be so bad? And that's maybe not such a hard question for us. We know that sin is the answer. But then our question is, God, why haven't you jumped in and done something about it, right? And that's a big challenge to us as Christians. It's one of the challenges that people that don't believe kind of throw at us. You know, what about evil? What do you guys think about evil? But the Bible does talk about it some, and we're going to talk about it. But before we go on to that, I want to note you know, it's not just a problem for us as believers in God. Those who don't believe in God also have a problem. Because if you don't believe that, there's a, that there is someone who created and made a moral order to the universe, then when you see these terrible, awful things, all you can say is, I don't like that, right? Because it, it can't be right or wrong. We could say our society doesn't like that, but it's all basically an opinion where we say that evil is wrong. It's just bad. And God doesn't want that in his world. But then we have the question of why doesn't God change it? And we'll look at this story because I think the story is going to help us. So Jesus told a parable, a story, a, a, an earthly story with a, heavenly meaning, me, uh, with a heavenly meaning, if you've heard the old people talk about what a, what a parable is. So let's talk about what this parable is. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So he says there's this guy that goes out and he sows seed in his field. And uh, while they were sleeping, an enemy comes and the enemy takes and he sows bad seed in the field. And then the, his servants come to him and say, hey, hey, you know what? There's an enemy came and he put bad seed in your field. Should we go and pull out all the weeds? Should we just pop out all the weeds? He says, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Just, just let them grow alongside with uh, the wheat. And then in the end, we'll all pluck that all out. We'll burn up the weeds and we'll save the wheat. That's Jesus' story. First thing you notice, right, is that Jesus is not, in this story, a very good farmer. Right? How, many, how many of you have gardens? Now, how many of you intentionally leave the weeds. I know sometimes people leave the weeds because they don't get around to it, but how many of you say, oh, there's some weeds out there. I'm just going to leave those weeds in my garden. No, you don't do that. And see, that's helpful because when we look at parables, the place that you look is the place where there's the twist. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? The, the twist is the Samaritan. Here's this guy. The priest comes along. He should be helping. Here's the, the Levite comes along. And then all of a sudden, the Samaritan twists the story, and the bad guy becomes the hero. So that's the place you look to try to figure out that parable. Or the story of uh, the son that runs away, you know, and he spends all his father's money. And when he comes back, what, what do we expect? What are you expecting at that time? The father's going to say, you dirty, rotten kid. You're worthless. No good. You spent half of our money, and now you're coming back like this. 
But what does he do? He runs out and hugs him. He embarrasses himself by running and pulling his, his skirt up, right? So, so there's the twist, and we, we look there for what the parable is all about. And you could go on. There's a story about the guys. They all work in the heat of the day, and the first ones get this uh, one denarius, and everybody's going, boy, I'm going to get more money, and then he doesn't give them more money. There's the twist, right? In this story, the twist is that whole thing about, okay, he's supposed to pull the weeds. We know we pull weeds. And there have been a lot of people that have looked at this story and said, well, you know, there's a special weed, it's Darnell, and it, it looks like wheat, and you can't really tell which one's which, and yeah, it, it intertwines itself with, uh, with the weeds. Okay, but Jesus understands that weeds are a bad thing, because if you look earlier in the chapter, Jesus notes that you gotta, the, the weeds are going to choke out and not allow things to bear fruit, right? So we know Jesus understands farming, so he's made this twist for a reason. And I think the twist is because he wants to tell us something not about farming, but about evil and about how the world works with evil in it. So let's look, because the disciples were kind of confused, and so when they went into the house, they said, um, hey, uh, can you explain this parable to us? We, we don't quite get it. So Jesus says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So Jesus is the sower. So what did God do about evil? What's the first thing he did about evil? He sent a sower. He sent Jesus, right? He had, a, he had an answer, and Jesus is the one that came to plant good in the world, and he came to inaugurate a kingdom that would start to change this world that we live in. He did have an answer for evil. People say, well, why hasn't God done something? He did do something. He sent his son, Jesus, into the world. And this kingdom, this kingdom is where? It's in the world. He goes on. Jesus says, all right, the field is the world and the good seed. These are the children of the kingdom. The kingdom's here in the world. And who's the good seed? Answer. All of us, right? We're the good seed. What else did God do about evil in the world? He did you. He did me. He put us into the world to, be, to, be, uh, uh, to, to, to work at changing the world. There's another parable, and it's actually in this chapter between the parable and the explanation, and it's the story of this woman that is, uh, that's putting yeast in bread, and the twist there is that she's not just she's got a little loaf of bread she's making. She's got 100 pounds worth of flour. This, this woman is like... I'm mixing this little tiny bit of yeast. And the thing is, it seems like it's an impossible thing, but she puts that little tiny bit of yeast and she mixes it in and this whole, whole thing seems like it's not going to do any good, but slowly the yeast rises and affects the whole dough, right? And that's what God says. I'm putting my good seed into this world and that good seed is going to make a difference. That good seed is going to go and grow and make a difference in this evil and awful world. So how do we make a difference? I think Isaiah 58 says it's best. It's talking about the kind of fast that God wants his people to have. Not a fast that just makes yourself look good, not to lose weight, not to do any of that kind of stuff, but the fast is this. Isn't this the fast I choose? To break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? To bring the poor and the homeless into your house? to clothe the naked when you see him, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood, then your light will appear like the dawn, and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you. The Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Yeah, when we live as God's people, when we live in that way, when we truly live in a, a way that brings justice and righteousness and cares for those that are hurting in our world, we are a we're, we're, we're fighting against that, that evil in the world. We're that, that salt, that we're, we're the light, we're the people that change this evil world and all those things that happen. But the weeds, they're the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. See, we're not alone. There's also children of the devil here. And the temptation is, like we said with the kids, you can't always tell which one's the children of light and the children of the devil, and we want to pluck them out. You know, we want to deal with evil in our own terms. We want to go out there and get rid of them. You know, start plucking out, hey, you know, we'll, we'll get rid of all the bad people. We'll wipe them out. But Jesus says, no, do not repay anyone evil for evil. This is Romans 12, 17. But be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Like Jesus, we overcome evil not with violence or force, but with a humble trust in God as we do what's right. 
Like Jesus, we overcome evil not with violence or force, but with a humble trust in God as we do what is right. Did you hear that? So it's not, we're not going out to fight evil like crusaders running around with swords and things, but we are loving other people and humbly allowing evil to, to even take its best shot at us. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they'll gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So, ultimately, God is going to take care of evil. Right? He says, ultimately, he's going to deal with it. He's going to wipe it all out. When we're with him in his kingdom, long term, there's not going to be any evil around for us to deal with. He's promised that, and we've overcome that evil. So what are God's answers to this evil in our world? He's given us three. First, it's, he gave us a sower, Jesus. Jesus came into the world. And when Jesus came into the world, he was God in human flesh, right? So he came into the world, and the world gave the worst evil it possibly could to Jesus. It took him and it put him on a cross. But by submitting to that evil, he overcame that evil. And he inaugurated a kingdom that is transforming our world as it transforms us. And we continue to be Jesus' yeast and Jesus' uh, good seed in the world. Another good thing about Jesus overcoming evil is he doesn't just overcome it out there. He also overcomes it inside here, right? All of us look at our hearts and sometimes we go, man, oh, man, I, I would like to be the person that God wants me to be, but I fall down again and again. But Jesus' love and grace comes to us and says, you know what? I forgive you, and now my spirit is going to help you to become those people that I want you to be. And that's the next part. Jesus planted his good seed. That's his second answer to evil. Jesus, he sent Jesus, and then he sends us as Jesus' body, the good seed, and his kingdom is growing. So what's God's answer to evil? Us. Me. Say it. What's God's answer to evil? Me. Now you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's focused on God, not on me. That's right. But it's God living in you. You are the body of Christ. You are God's people in the world. You're not, you can't just say, well, it all depends on God, whatever God wants to do. That's right. But what God wants to do is work through you to change our world. As you love one another, as you love people, as we work for justice and rightness, as we, we do that, we change this world because Jesus is living in us and through us. And then the third thing he says is that God's going to sort it out in the end. We don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to know, you know, hey, we live our life and it sometimes seems like evil is winning, but we have a trust that ultimately in the end God is going to overcome. And so I'd like to go back. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Let everyone who has ears listen. So God saw all that he made and it was very good indeed. And Christians cared for the poor and the suffering through hospitals and orphanages and in their own lives. God saw all that he, was, he made, and it was very good indeed. And Christians valued each individual and, that was made in the image of God and fought against slavery and racial and other kinds of injustice. God saw all that he made, and it was very good indeed. And Christians valued education and started schools and universities and places like Little Dove to try to help and make sure that people would know the love of Jesus. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. And 70% of all the food pantries and 60% of all the homeless shelter beds in America are provided by faith-based organizations, most of them churches, people that are responding to Jesus. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. And each individual Christian reached out to his neighbor and prayed for them and loved them. And that made a difference in the world. And that's what God calls us to be, to be salt and light, to make a difference in this world. I want to finish with story. I like stories. You like stories? Everybody likes stories, right? It's a story of Stuart Holden. Um, he was in Egypt, and he met a sur uh, sergeant in the Highland Regiment. And he said, hey, you know, how did you become a Christian? And he said, well, there was a guy in our regiment, a private, and he had been converted while we were out on, uh, in our, what do you call it, uh, when, when we were on 
Maneuvers, yeah. And so I gave him a really hard time, the guy said. I gave him a really, really hard time, and I used to bother him. And he would kneel down by his bed and say his prayers. And one day I'd come in, and I, was, I saw this guy kneeling there. So what I did is I had just been out on a, a trek, and my boots were all muddy and, and yucky, and I took them and I threw them at the guy's head. And it hit him in the back of the head, and the guy just continued praying. And I went to bed and didn't worry about it. And he said, the next morning I woke up, and my boots, they were cleaned, as clean as I'd ever seen them before, and they were shined, and they were put at the foot of my bed. And the guy said, wow, that made a difference for me. And then he became a Christian as well. See, that's how we overcome evil. It's by living Jesus each and every day in our lives. And I pray that as we see our world, because it's so tempting as we see the Internet, you know, you see all those things on the Internet to just complain and say, look, our world's going to wherever, you know. It's tempting to say that. But instead we should say, Jesus, how can I love the people around me today? If the world needs it, how can I love people that you put in front of me because I know you love me? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your wonderful love for us. Thank you that you love us so much that you sent Jesus uh, to sow his seed in this world. Thank you that you've chosen us to be your good seed, to love those around us. And thank you that ultimately we know that you're going to overcome all evil and that when we live with you forever, it's not going to be an issue because you're going to take care of it. Help us to have that faith today and every day. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Let's continue. You can stand if you're here, if you'd like to. If you're at home and you want to stand, you can. Or sit if it's more comfortable for you. We are going to confess the Apostles' Creed. This is a statement of faith that uh, Christians have said together for a long, long time. It goes back to the, uh, at least the second century, possibly the first century. Let's confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's, you can be seated if you'd like. Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, then you answer, hear our prayer. Audrey, do we have any other prayer requests? Okay, nobody else put them on. All right, let's pray. Lord, you have been the refuge and strength of your people from generation to generation. Give to us the comfort of your presence in time of trouble, your grace to forgive our sins, your peace to govern our hearts, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your power holds all things together in heaven and on earth. Give wisdom to those who lead our nation and guidance to those who make, administer, and judge our laws so that life may be protected and justice administered. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for those who peacefully protest that their voices may be heard and their complaints may be understood. We pray for leaders as they respond to those who protest that they would be able to keep peace without excessive force. We ask that you bring peace to our nation and to our world, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we recognize that our prosperity and peace have sometimes been at the expense of others. Forgive us and help us to work for freedom, prosperity, and justice for all, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we lift up to you the families of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Eric Hash, Richard Brooks, Damon Gutzwiller, Patrick Underwood, David Dorn, Julian Keene, Amariah Jones, Horace Lorenzo Anderson Jr., Natalie Wallace, all of those killed in Chicago and other places through violence, and all of those who are grieving these and other losses, Lord, in your mercy. Loving Father, we ask your blessing on all police and first responders in our nation, especially for Kent and for Karen's daughter. Protect them and they serve and give us wisdom to know how best to support them 
as we also seek to hold those who misuse their authority accountable. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up to you the nations of the world that your grace and peace would go out and transform every nation into a nation that upholds justice, peace, and prosperity for all. We especially hold before you the nations of Brazil, Peru, Bolivia. Guide their leaders and let your word transform their nations, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your word speaks hope and life. Open our ears to hear your voice and our hearts to believe in Jesus Christ, to follow him as Savior and Lord, Lord, in your mercy. Lord, your mercy extends to all our needs and your grace gives healing according to your will. Hear us on behalf of Lynn and Travis as they struggle with that cancer. Lord, I, I pray that you will walk with them and help them through this, this time and bring them healing and give them your comfort, the comfort of your presence and just to help the doctors to know how best to help them. We pray again for Kenna who's missing still, and for her family. It's got to be so hard as it goes on week after week, and they don't know what's happened to her. Help them to find closure and to figure out what happened to Kenna. We pray that she will be all right and be reunited with her family. Lord, be with Nancy, as I know she's uh, continuing to deal with some health issues. And for all of the shoulder issues of uh, different people in our congregation, especially Lalo as he gets ready uh, to have surgery, we pray for continued peace for the family of Irene as they continue to grieve her. We lift up to you Tony, who is also suffering from cancer, and I pray that you will be with him in the very aggressive treatment that they're treating him with. We also pray for the family of Danny, uh, Lord, as, as they grieve and they miss Danny, they, they, um, as they go through this time where there's going to be less people around, I pray that you will give them an a, a extra dose of your grace. And, Lord, we pray for all of these that we lift up right now. Feel free to mention someone. And for all those who we've mentioned out loud, as well as those we've mentioned in our hearts, and all who stand in need, grant them grace sufficient for all their needs, and sustain them in their hour of trial. Lord, in your mercy. Loving Father, we continue to be plagued by the coronavirus and the economic devastation caused by our attempts to control it. Help us that we may seek you as our true healer and savior from all plagues and problems in this world. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all essential workers, the unemployed, small businesses, those suffering in the time of crisis, that you may meet all our needs, and that you would move your people to be generous to all those in need, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all nursing facilities, especially the one where Cindy works in Florida and where Vicki works here in Monroe. We pray for also Regency. And Lord, we pray you'll protect the residents and the staff from the virus, especially those of us that are our people, the people that are there, um, Arlene and Gottlieb and... Uh, And Michael's mother, whose name just escaped me for some crazy reason. And Lord, keep them from loneliness and despair. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. We pray the words you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're very thankful for the Lord's blessings and we're going to uh, give thanks for the offerings of, of God's people. Father, you have provided all of our needs and you have provided for all of your people and we thank you for the generosity of your people as they've sowed in your kingdom. Allow your people to use these gifts in a way that honors you and extends your kingdom. We thank and praise you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, receive the Lord's blessing.
May he grant your heart's desires. Make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all your prayers. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.